Thomas, welcome to the show. You sent me an email there a few weeks ago telling me that you had recently been doing a bit of research into the Soviet planning system. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you've learned over the last few months? Yeah, so uh, basically I see a lot of people who uh, they seem to be arguing against fiction. So I like to call this uh, Uncle Joe sits in his office and decides things about the you know entire Soviet economy, which isn't how it worked at all. You can also call it like straw planning, perhaps. It has more akin to a distributed control system when you start looking at it. Because you have like different uh, departments that, that coordinate things between each other. It's not strictly hierarchical. You know, you have your multiple ministries that both talk to Gosplan. They talk to the workplaces, but they also talk to the other ministries. So there is, uh, I've seen the word heterarchy used to describe this system. So, so for example, a big issue they had is that Gosplan couldn't plan for everything. They didn't have the data. And all they're getting is aggregate statistics, for example, that they kind of have to do an approximate thing with. Yeah, I'd say it's very interesting to see how it worked and even more interesting how it didn't work. Like both in cases like failures in the system, but also as pure, like it seems a lot of people just imagine uh, that the Soviet economy worked in various ways, which it didn't. Right. So we've been reading, just recently finished a chapter for the book we're writing on, on central planning, and we've been doing similar work to yourself. And, you know, when you get into it, you, you see that it's actually a mix of centralized, decentralized and every layer in between. Like the idea that everything was centralized is is greatly exaggerated. One of the stats that we have that we came across in one of these papers was that uh, by like the late 1970s, there was only around just shy of about 2000 products that were centrally planned. Everything else was decentrally planned at the Republic or the local levels, you know, which is very different than what we, from what even the kind of literature between the Austrians and the, and arguing with, with the socialists about how the planning went as in, it, it doesn't seem to correspond to the reality of the social planning system. Yeah, uh, one thing I, I uh, like saying, or I've been thinking about saying, it's a little bit provocative, but the Soviet economy was neither planned, or like neither centralized nor planned. So because, you know, you have different departments doing their own thing, coordinating amongst each other. And there is a paper called The Soviet Union Has an Administered, Not a Planned Economy by John Howard Wilhelm which kind of makes the same point that it's a lot of ex post control uh, as opposed to ex ante, which is a point that Nick Rogers made as well on the previous guest. So uh, yeah, it's when you start reading about it and people have been trying to model it as well. Uh, I found a paper uh, by Michael Manov called A Model of Soviet Type Economic Planning, which tries to mathematically model how the, the Soviet economy worked uh, it's still like approximate, like it's never, you know, but they show that it actually does converge eventually on a solution. But it's just, it takes a couple of iterations and the system is so slow, you know, it takes months and months of, of back and forth, uh, which is kind of why we want to automate this, or at least I would like to automate it. Basically, because it, we see what happens if you don't, you can only manage a couple of thousand goods and that's it. Yeah, like uh, the the Soviet economies, they they replace like the kind of quick market feedback function with a slow planning feedback function. You know, in an effect, it added a fetter to the mode of production that isn't there in capitalism. Yeah, I I wrote about this recently. Actually, it, it occurred to me, and this connects to the good regulator theorem that the Soviet economy did work like for seventy years. It obviously worked. Like they, they, they <laughs> it didn't collapse immediately. Let's say, or or was dismantled. But I suspect the reason that it could function despite the slowness is because they use feed-forward planning. So the entire point of having, for example, technical coefficients that describes 
how a workplace functions is so that you can kind of you can anticipate what all the both the upstream and the downstream workplaces need and then then you have kind of a slop left that you have to deal with and often there's where you get the gray market and stuff to kind of paper over some of the uh, you know you, you might get a 95% solution doing it by by hand and with this slow approach but it's you know it's it kind of works so it's it's very fascinating so when you say a feed forward feed forward function what do you mean so basically there there are two ways of affecting control there's feedback and there's feed forward and feedback is when you have you control a valve for example based on an error signal so or for example you want to control the the temperature of a room and you control your heater well you could either have a thermometer in the room that you you know you read off and then as the temperature shifts from your desired set point you increase the power of your heater and then you know the typical pid control but what's better is that you measure the temperature outside the room in advance because you know that if if the temperature differs outside you know that the temperature inside the room will match it in time so you can control the heater in anticipation of the room's temperature changing perhaps a simpler explanation a simpler comparison is you know when you get goosebumps on your arm that's a that's a form of feed forward control so the body wants to maintain a certain temperature and there is a system where if your core temperature goes down it'll increase you know it'll spend uh, energy to to get it warmer again but if if you get cold wind over your your hand or over your arm then the body thinks that oh wait a minute i'm going to get cold so i better i better raise the hairs on my arm here to to counteract this and that's a much faster thing so it it yeah it's kind of in anticipation so so this gets to the same like the point that nick rogers was making last last episode which is completely correct that like any functioning economy has both ex post and ex ante elements yes that there's no ex there's no pure ex ante or ex post capitalism plans and reacts and a socialist society would need to plan and react also C- correct and uh, you could say and there is a bit of language problem here so you could say that we have planned planning and unplanned planning so a little bit of a wordplay there. So explain what you mean when you, by what you're trying to get at there by what you mean as planning. Well, so planning, when we say planning, what we really mean, and I'm going to borrow here a term from Meretz and Sutterlitti, they use the term mediation in kind, as opposed to mediation by value. And this is what planning is. And then we have various ways of, you know, doing this mediation, you know, making sure we get all the use values we we want where we need them. Uh, and you can either do this, you know, ki- try trying to anticipate what's going to be necessary. Uh, and that's, that is ex ante, and it's quite kind of formally equivalent to feed forward. But you will always have a kind of an error, and that's, that's where your ex post regulation comes in. So... You still need exposed, and it is fundamentally ex- exposed anyway, because you're, if you're modeling a workplace, say, that's making, I don't know, socks or shoes or whatever, and you, you might not know in advance how much is necessary, I know, how many inputs are necessary. But over time, you will build up statistics that will tell you, like, okay, usually we need this much. And that is a kind of an exposed modeling that can be used for ex ante production or you know ordering things in advance so you you get the stuff precisely when you need it maybe with a bit of margin you know 10 percent extra a planner is a dozen let's say right so we have you know we have this kind of idea particularly from modern pulp production that well it's not just from that but it emphasizes it that like the structure of the productive economy is a function of the consumption of the economy 
and that plays out through what you're pointing out there that it is the consumption that determines what our actual ex ante planning will do because we're using the historical data to build up our visions of what is required for planning going forward. Yes, and even in cases where you have, so there are cases where you don't have this data and you might not be able to get it. But if you take something that I'm familiar with, which is building electronics, then every electronic thing, like if you look at your mobile phone, that has a bill of materials. So you know exactly what is necessary to make a phone. But that's not the entire story still, because first of all, it takes a certain amount of labor to put it together. And you have a yield. So you're not going to get 100% yield when you're making anything. So you might get 99%. So you have to take that into account as well, So which is something you do when you order parts for an electronics project. You order a little bit extra because, you know, the yield will not be 100%. But if you're making a lot of something and you, you don't want to waste resources, preferably, then you'd like to order as close to precisely as many parts are necessary. Although, you, you know, it's never, you know, you, you don't actually know. But yeah, it's a difficult problem. Now, you you were saying to me that you, you think that the Soviet planning system was cybernetically valid. Do you want to uh, get into your thoughts on this? Yeah, so the Soviet system was a, a viable system and it follows the Berian VSM when you look at it. It has all these, all of its features. And you can even like, you can use control theory to understand why it worked poorly, let's say. But I would still say it was a viable system, obviously, because it reproduced itself. And you, you have all of this kind of separation of concerns and the attenuation up the chain of command, so to speak, even though, you know, it's. It's not strictly hierarchical, but yeah, still. So, and I know that's a controversial opinion, but yeah, yeah. So we, we you know, in our analysis now, we make out a, a strong case in the book for how it's it's actually not uh, cybernetically uh, viable. But uh, what I would say is that the Soviets and the planners and the bureaucracy, it's not as non-viable as I think a lot of people make out it to have been that they were extremely yeah. practical people and that, what would you say, the ideological element of the party or the society would have said planning, we do planning in advance and conscious planning, but in reality, it was highly reactive and it was trying simply to try and, and get things to work. So I, I, I disagree with you that, was, that it was a, a cybernetically valid, but there was definitely an attempt by them to to get the thing to work, right? I would say as well that like the, the existence of a system for a long period of time doesn't necessarily mean that it was cybernetically valid. Like, you know, Beer in, in his analysis will take examples of companies where basically the system four function was missing and they plot along for ages and then they uh, eventually fall over because they don't have long-term viability built in. And I think there's definitely elements of that. I think there's, uh, elements missing in the local management function as well with the lack of, of uh, the lack of a hard budget constraint so i think there's, there's there's i think there's quite a few elements that was probably quite lacking but not to say that it's non-functional as stereotypically was made out yeah no uh, and i i think you can quantify like some of these problems when you look at the again the good regulator theorem lays down some of the the concepts here so like the perfect regulator would have would consist of like a perfect model and like perfect actuators, zero delay, like a short a planning period as possible, and an infinite plan horizon. That would be kind of your perfect thing. So you said serial delay. What do you mean there? The like the delay between you know a, an error occurring or whatever, and the system correcting for it. You want this to be as short as possible. So what's called the, it's really the plan period. And ideally, you know, we'd like a plan period of one second or something. But maybe that's not practical for, for workplaces to have uh, orders change every second. But yeah, I, I agree. Like, I, this is kind of a purposeful uh, <laughs> position to generate discussion. 
Well, I suppose it, it gets down to, because I think we have, like, uh, myself and Donald and, and, and yourself, we kind of have a, uh, you know, we would have a, a fundamental disagreement about what is the nature of planning, like what planning means. Do you want to like, because we, we have it as a, it's much more like the, we would see that the a socialist planning would model in large senses capitalist planning as opposed to something radically different. But the planning is based upon communist social relations, where I think you have a conception that is still wedded to a type of, forgive me if I'm misrepresenting it now, but some kind of centralized control of planning in the sense that a, a solver that gets a whole load of information and finds out uh, centrally what what is an optimal solution for the economy. Yeah, well, first of all, yes, you have to have full centralization. That is a necessary thing for good regulation. It, it is very difficult to make a good regulator without full logical centralization. You want all the data. There is a second issue where, so suppose you want to make, uh, you want a viable plan, let's say, that stretches hundreds of years into the future. Because you can't, you can't have like, a, you, you have to look further than the, nec- the next plan period. You can't like just look one year ahead. You have to look, it's, it's in control theory, this is known as receding horizon planning which Dave Zachariah has been working on with Luca Hogberg. And then, you know, you get, you get the question like, okay, well, how do you ensure that you have feasibility in your system? Like, you will have millions of constraints that you have to satisfy. And you, ca- you can't do this by hand or by discussing with people. You, you, have, to, you have to have a, a computer have at it. But of course, you know, you position your... your political structure around it but if you start trying to split it up and you put people in between to mediate the planning process then you will reinstantiate the problems of the soviet system because uh, part of the issue is that you have <laughs> people in there that have low bandwidth they are self-interested and like they lie this very recurring theme is that they they this kind of planning poker, which we, we would like to get away from. But there is also the question of like, what does the word central mean? Like if we talk about central planning, what exactly is it that we're centralizing? Because you can have all the data in one place. And I would argue you have to have all the data in, in one place. It has to be accessible as a single state, uh, which I believe you and Donald are saying as well with the general ledger. Yeah, that's that's centralized. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a centralization of data, but it's a difference from centralization of control. Like if you look at the viable system model, the whole yeah. thing is about variety, you know, management, having requisite variety at the different levels. And so like it is not the case that the system, say, five has full centralization of control of what everything is done. That the, the very epitome of a viable self-organized system is that it's, it attenuates variety up the chain massively to allow the central nodes to be able to plan, okay, uh, and maintain the coherence of the, the organism as a whole. So like, it's fundamentally not the case that like the, you know, the CEO sitting in the office, like Beer would say he should have access to every single piece of point of information in the firm that the system five actually just gives more directional and policy type issuance, you know, whereas they're not making decisions about what type of plastic should we apply to this or what type of rubber band should be used on this part of a pulley on a machine. Yeah, no, but those are, some of those are technical decisions that are, you know, you can leave it up to to workers to to figure out, or you can automatically choose between different production uh, methods but you see but that's not full centralization that's decentralized control no 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 where apl- apl- applicable. okay so it's it depends on what you mean like again it's like words are very important so what me and dave are trying to get at is that it's basically what what uh, max greenberry talks about like automating away the center you you want to push it down to the workplaces and the stuff you have on top so you might have 
decision, like deciding bodies around the planning system. That, for example, uh, let's take environmental constraints. Yeah, ha- someone has to decide what the atmospheric composition is going to be, and once decided, you encode it, and that's that. You you put it into the system. It's there as an in-kind constraint. You are not allowed to violate it. And if you do, there will probably be repercussions. But so, but you might also talk about like who can act in the system. And that's, of course, like that's an entire, you know, uh, that's, that's politics eventually. But uh, we cannot have it to where workplaces can basically emit however much they want. And it's very difficult. Like, I haven't seen any proposal, like, how would you deal with, let's say, emissions without having a global view? We have, there's, like, very strong theory suggesting that, like, you you have to kind of... Yeah, well, I have no disagreements that you have to have global view on certain elements. So, like, the, the point, like, that we would say is that things that need to be decided globally shouldn't be decided globally. Things that need to be decided, you know, at different layers of recursion uh, should be decided at different layers of recursion. You know, this is all, uh, you know, cybernetically kind of basic stuff. But when we get towards full centralization, like that was just like that was the thing you said, we need full centralization. That would that would say to me, you know, that everything needs to be centralized. And that would seem to be kind of not cybernetically valid if I'm understanding you correctly. Well, it again, it depends on what you centralize. It depends on what you mean. So we're making... But like the word full, like if... So for example, me and Donald would, on our, our analysis, would say, you know, absolutely, things certain things need to be centralized, right? And other things don't need to be centralized, right? Uh, you know, you know, uh, what is the amount of theatres in a district is certainly not something for like the world planning body to care about, but uh, what is the level of, uh, you know, uh, oil use or natural gas use uh, or lithium mining or something might actually be something that is global in effect. Yeah. And should be centralized. Yeah. Well, it, it then they're talking about decision power, right? And you're not talking about the planning system as such, I would argue. So what we want is that people struggle over the same system so you're you know you have everyone connects to the same database or whatever and you can get all you know you can get your all your accounting for example all your uh, you you can have a general catalog for example i i don't know if you mentioned that Uh, that's one thing i i would want to have because it's incredibly irritating that you have different like i can't just order a thing like i don't know copper pipes I have to go to each and every damn distributor and see if they have it. It's annoying. It works differently. But it, it, to some extent, I suspect there is a, a the, there is a bit of a language issue, and maybe if, maybe full centralization doesn't quite describe what I'm getting at. It's kind of that's the problem with language. So, well, let's talk about it from the point of view of maybe the solver. Okay, because I think this is something that's integral to your work. So that there is uh, the data is somehow centralized and then it is, there is a decision made centrally about how to optimize production. Would that be a fair representation? Well, you don't need to optimize production. That's something I've recently come to realize. Uh, so I mean, disagree. OK, optimize in, right, optimize in some fashion, as in optimize for viability as opposed to maybe optimize for output or whatever. Well, but there are some criteria which you're solving centrally. Well, suppose you have a certain, you're at a certain operating point. You'd like to be able to tell each workplace, you can operate within these bounds, for example. Uh, it's something I've been looking at recently. This, this um, I forget what I, what I called the post, but yeah, it's a quantifying autonomy and planning. My point here is to try, and, when you start having bounds in your system, you cannot have like, uh, I don't know, workplaces burning barrels of oil for no reason. <clears throat> there is a question of like how much wiggle room does each workplace have? There, there's, I cannot think of any way to deal with this without computation. And then you can then you know, like tell 
every workplace like okay you can you can move within this without having to talk to anyone you, you can make you know you can plan your own production locally as long as you're within this rectangle or whatever but as soon as you start stepping outside then you need to coordinate with other workplaces and it, it starts slowing down the thing you start getting into like uh, uh worse but it, you don't necessarily need to have a solver i think what i would say is you need some mechanism by which in-kind constraints are respected yeah no i, I we fully agree with that and we think that that what you're talking really about is a system of algodonics so for people who aren't up on the cybernetic lingo this is like beer's idea between say different elements in the control system of like the the vsm between your local management your uh, the cold face element your system one and your planning and your basically your boardroom your executive decision making of an organization of a particular recursion that there are pain signals that can go through for example the example you're saying is that some workplace is using way too much oil and that will trigger a warning and that will need to be essentially resolved at either within that higher within that VSM itself or perhaps even externally it pings up towards the great chain of being. Yeah, we fundamentally think that is the correct approach, but I don't understand when you say computation to do with that. So I, I think we're kind of getting towards I don't know if, if we are have quite we're moving to it's towards a similar ground, but it's like that when you say computation in this sense, do you mean like a system of thresholds that trigger behaviors or, you know, as opposed to a global solver? Well, it depends on what you want to do. So you could, for example, optimize locally if you want. In a certain region, you might say, we want to maximize the number of slides or whatever, you know, the number of playgrounds here. We want to build. Or we want to move from having no playground to having 10 playgrounds or whatever. That's something that's called goal programming. But you want to make sure you can do this without stepping on anyone else's toes. And that requires uh, computation. So, but if we take a counter example, like the kind of thing that I would say we don't need to do any. When you say computation, sorry, I, 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 sorry, you say computation, and I'm, I'm not certain what you mean. So when you say computation, like what, what do you mean when you say computation? There, say that example of a district wants to have more slides, more playgrounds. Say, well, let's say you want to figure out what kind of what level of autonomy you have, uh, like what what kind of decisions can I make locally without interfering with anyone else, and in this post. I demonstrate how you can do this. You can give each workplace an interval, basically, saying like, okay, you can operate within these intervals, no problem. And doing that requires computation. Like you have to compute, uh, you have to fit a box inside your plan polytope, like, or your constraint polytope. So you, given like environmental constraints, constraints of the number of labor hours available on you know what people need food etc like there are clearly certain operating points which are unacceptable like you, you can't have the you can't allow the oil refinery to stop because you need fuel so that 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 cannot they cannot decide to stop <laughs> like because then <laughs> people will die and of course, you need to figure out then a political system on top of this. Like, so that's, and I, we don't say much about that other than saying like, okay, there will be some political system. There will be a way, like people will need to decide the boundaries. But I would argue you, you could allow a lot of autonomy within said boundaries. And I don't think you need to, uh, at least what me and Dave are saying, if you're going to optimize on something, or minimize something, minimize labor in that case. We would be very much opposed to what Cockshot and his student, uh, Philip Daprich, who are still going on about this, you know, maximizing GDP, which I think is very silly. I don't think we should do that. Because then, yeah, because then you get the question, okay, you have an objective function that you're, you're maximizing, let's say. Well, who decides the objective function? 
Right, yeah. So the society should determine for itself what it optimizes in any kind of unalienated society. So like I would say that when computation is used typically in the type of conversations that we have, and I think some of the definitely some of the discussions we've had before, it's definitely more at the level of a centralized solver. Like, for example, the type of things that you're talking about, from our point of view, as all information is sitting and it's sitting on the gen on the general ledger for a particular. Let's take an example of the oil refinery that the lads in the oil refinery say, ah, oh, lad, let's let's just go on the booze. Let's not bother working today. Right. Mm. That it, it that the the actual flows of goods and materials, the transactions get picked up on the general ledger immediately as being missing. You know, there is yeah. no deliveries today when there should be 25,000 barrels of oil delivered or whatever. And that that sitting on top of the general ledger is a whole system of like what is essentially the the, the that al- that allows uh, planning to occur w- with like algodonics and building in a uh, sitting on top of it as basically a kind of a platform things that lay out what are the social relations of production and the management and the control system upon that. And so, like, to the extent that that is comp- computation, well, we're full on for our computation, right? Yeah. To, to the extent that there is solving, like, as in technical solving, like, if we look at capitalism, capitalism does use input-output sometimes stuff to do things. It, not yeah. a lot, not a lot, but it does use it. And to the extent that where optimization can be uh, done within the production system or even within, say, trying to understand planning at a larger scales, to the extent that they help, you know, we, we're like completely uh, agnostic as to what tools are used. But the idea that the planning is centralized, that information is sent to the center and the plan is centralized, we think that that is, uh, we will argue, compl- you know, strongly against that for cybernetic reasons but also um if we look to how pull production if we were to look at say the centralized ideas of production in the soviet union of central planning that's much more closely aligned to kind of like a fordist maximization of mass production based uh, management system as opposed to say like a toyota production system where things are pull production and they are self-organized and so to the extent that like Marx critiqued Proudhon for wanting to go back to artisanal production as the basis for socialism, we will argue against a return to a centralized, if we want to call it the solver, centralization of data, but not to say that data, you can't use techniques or that data is not open to everybody and thus centralized, (laughs) if you get the distinction. No, I think what some people are afraid of is so me and Dave use the term uh, data a- data asymmetry to describe like one of the problems of the Soviet Union. It's like people have privileged access to data, which is bad. <laughs> like we want it, we want it to be completely open. It would be beneficial to know what the other guys are doing, like the other workplaces and what they're planning on doing. So they they might. <clears throat> so if we have a system of of um, constraints, let's say it can suggest a set of plans but these suggestions have to be concretized and it it may be tricky to fully explain but say you you are to produce i don't know uh, you need to produce propane and petrol basically and uh, let's produce like you might have different plants that are slightly better at one or the other they could jointly agree to take on certain parts of production and then sort of post that to the ledger or whatever you call it, the order system. So you've committed to doing this specific thing, but then you have the planning system. There will still be like a residue of stuff that needs to be done, but then it can, as soon as you post your concrete order, you know, what what you're taking on, the system can replan and re-suggest new things to other workplaces automatically so you you remove degrees of freedom from the system yeah because people have taken on work but yeah you don't necessarily need to have it to where you know you're computing a single point that everyone has to operate on 
or else. You can have it to be a little bit more, you can have a lot more leeway, a lot more, you know, local autonomy. But it has to still be within bounds. So you have to figure out what the bounds are. Like you have to, you'd, you'd like to orthogonalize the different parts of the system. And that, that is a very tricky thing. When you say orthogonalize, you know, I don't know, it's a mathematical term, so people might know what you mean. In this context, what, you, what do you mean? You want to have different elements that are essentially you can cleave off and be separate and, and solve separately, I assume. Yeah, it, it would be asking the question, like, to what extent can people operate completely independently? And figuring that out is, is uh, it's difficult even on a computer. So, and the nice thing about it is you, you, well, you know, you can do whatever you want. You can sort out all the details about uh, oil production or whatever, so long as kind of the cleaving plane, as, as long as you kind of, yeah, it's, it's difficult to explain, let's say. But I, I would say I, I, I don't think we have to go for this, like, okay, you, you compute a single plan and that's it. I think you can have a little bit more uncertainty, let's say. I would say from our point of view, planning is a management of constraints, essentially. It's are we constrained by the amount of teak we can cut down, the amount of oil we can produce, the amount of land use we want to have, the amount of time people want to work that it's uh, the amount of labor that that needs to be involved in producing a certain output that all these are constraints and that we have this in- incredibly complex n-dimensional <laughs> blob yeah. that is trying to maintain its presence in a certain position of viability you know a sphere of what do they call it uh, i can't remember the technical term and it is not true like a centralization of of every point of production but it's really it's self-organization were valid and also changing in grand scale policy where required to maintain this n-dimensional economic blob in a particular area of viability yeah you know and so that's that's what capitalism essentially does although it's based on a class system uh it's centralized where it needs to be centralized you know it's got the state and it's got central banks and it also has corner shops and it's got a chipper down the road right and in between it'll have a business organization uh, as well we're like so we we kind of were modeling not to say that capitalism is long-term viable no more than the soviet union is right but that it's in a kind of a a temporary area of a, vi- a viability space um but what we see as the kind of mode to try and get to or the to get to the type of ability to make those decisions that you're making is is the concept of recursion so the nested layers of viable systems so for example if we were to talk about like perhaps what was the example refineries or something oil refineries that we might have at the higher level of recursion we might have an oil refineries association of producers and that that will be able to regulate the lower levels and it must be self-interested in regulating the lower levels and also that at a higher level of recursion there might be an energy one and the energy one might be uh, motivated to to say to the wind farms hey guys you got to do this and to the oil producers you got to do this and that the whole thing has to be cybernetically valid but also social relationally valid that people are self-interested in the control system in in being the control system yeah I think we like we seem to be get, uh, finding common ground in some of this. I think, yeah, but I like some. Mm, of course, like you, you can. Uh, there are limits to how much you can steer from these higher, like the energy department or whatever. Uh, but they might put in like, okay, we need these many. No, they might not even because. <clears throat> so, for example, the need for for electricity comes from the demand for stuff. That needs electricity, so that's not really something that they can decide. That's more a well, it's this ex post ex ante, isn't it? Feed forward feedback madness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 dialectical, you see. But uh, if we could, t- but we could take one example where you might need to go with this kind of more Soviet style, rather aggressive, and that is, uh, you know, global warming. So that will require an immense shift. Uh, and, and Dave has been making the point 
and uh, Dave Zachariah, if people, if the listeners don't know. Dave has made the point, or I think we both made the point at the Marx 22 conference in Stockholm, that the amount of coordination and the amount of resources necessary to deal with the climate crisis is greater than the Second World War. Like the, the sophistication in, in, in like organization and everything is so much bigger. <laughs> to some extent, you kind of have to... Uh, you, can, you can do it with constraints. So you, you can have an emissions constraint that you constantly push down. And in fact, that's how a certain class of LP solvers work. So-called um, uh, central path methods. So you can have an emissions constraint that you're you're moving slowly, slowly over time, so so people have time to adapt and and so on. So there is kind of you you can try to do kind of a crash decarbonization, but there are uh, like if you try to optimize on emissions, so you have your objective function and you're you're pushing it really hard in a certain direction, you will reach like a corner in the system, like you will hit up against a whole bunch, bunch of constraints. And if there's any kind of error in those constraints, then you can easily get into like outside of uh, feasibility. So there is like a, a case to be made that like you can't be too, I don't know, too male about it, let's say, because, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a vector and it points in you know, rather than, you know, your constraint box in your economy. Yeah, but I think we're sort of in agreement, but there again, like there, there isn't language for this stuff. It's very difficult to get at what because I, I like to think like, how would I use a system like this? How would I, like, I have some petty means of production. Like, how do I, how could I make them available to a a prototype system? Let's say because I know stuff and I have tools. Well, you see here, Thomas, you see, you would, you would be part of the planners uh, associated producers and then you'd be able to share your knowledge and standardize our uh, work through through that, you know, because I think it, it's interesting looking at the Toyota production system because they like they rely on essentially these kind of pseudo communist relations where everybody gets the same wage on the production lines and they're all motivated to improve and and solve at the point of production the actual workers but also then what's heavy about it is in toyota is that they standardize once they solve a thing they standardize it and that's essentially what we're trying to get to in the solver but they do it just through pure social relations so for us it would be like you if you've got good ideas on your uh how the hell do we do this climate change stuff that it would be through the social relations of the structure of the you know productive system as in you would be say okay i want to work in in the climate stuff and uh ideas would percolate and standardize and uh, ideas would modify and, and progress in that manner and it's not just general ledger like you know this stuff was on the gen it's not like just a technical system it's a social relational system you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah of course there's there's more Yes, of course. But, you know, I'm an engineer, so I focus on, on practical problems. Oh, I mentioned or one thing that we could plug, because I realize you're, you you because I haven't heard you do it on the podcast, is the in-depth network. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, has it launched yet? It's launching on the 13th of July. And he'll be sending out, Eric Meyer will be sending out an invite uh, there's two events, one for Europe, Africa, the Middle East, kind of that part of the globe, and then for the Americas. And he, he would have liked to have like Asia and that part of the world, but there's not enough contacts. So maybe we should uh, encourage the listeners to point their web browser to uh, indep.network. Absolutely. Yeah, myself and... Donal and Ferdia, who people may know are kind of involved in that, mostly Ferdia doing all the groundwork, it must be said. And it's trying to get like a kind of an international planning network discussion area open to all, what do we say, tendencies as a kind of a, a way to move the uh, whole area forward. It's looking like it, it should be very interesting. It's supposed to launch soon. I missed the last couple of 
meetings due to work commitments, but hopefully it'll be a really good venue for people who are interested in, in these planning topics to maybe participate or go to read some stuff that gets put on the website or events that get put on. So, yeah, it's really interesting to see, though. There's a lot. I feel like there's a lot of um, interest in the general planning, socialist planning stuff. We just organised, um, myself, Donal and uh, Ferdia have put in a proposal for five panels at the Historical Materialism Conference in London this year. Like a couple of years ago, there would be zero. There would be nobody. They have a whole stream this year. Usually on, on, in the like these conferences, not that I know too much about them, but they'll have like, you know, areas of focus. And this year, post-capitalism, so like the kind of planning stuff was one which was it's good to see that there's movement and and work being done by people in Sweden and Dublin and all over the place. Yeah, and it's also it's like really important when you because if you look at like the climate debate, you either have like green capitalism or degrowth, and none of them are viable. Really, you have to kind of deal with this in a in an orderly fashion. You can't just blow up pipelines. Those are our pipelines you're talking about, or that Andreas Malm is talking about. Unless, of course, they're in uh, the Baltic Sea, and then you're well able to blow up whatever you want. No, no, they never blow. Do uh, we better? Uh, no, uh, we're we're shutting down the investigation. Yeah. no one is at fault. Yeah, it's a mystery. What pipeline? <laughs> Move along. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I saw Donald actually on uh, what was it? Marxism Today. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. Did you, didn't you see that they talked about the movie How to Blow Up a Pipeline? And I learned that uh, Donald has a has a, a record. He has, a, he has yeah. a, a pedigree, yes. He would be the expert in such matters. Let's just put yes. it like that. Leave it like that. Yes, yes. Yeah, that was really interesting. But yeah, that's a thing that we, me and Dave are trying to get at uh, with the environmental thing. Like, we're going to need to use refineries and pipelines. But like we have to feed them like I don't know scrap wood or whatever from gasification, like you, you can turn bio waste and you can do like becks right bio energy with carbon capture and storage. So you one example would be you take trees or you take wood waste. So you get you take that to a gasification plant, you dry distill it. And you get syngas out of it. And for listeners who may not be aware, syngas is a mixture of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. This you can turn into oil using what's known as the fischer tropsch process. Uh, the Germans did this during the, the Second World War. With coal. They used coal, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, but you get coal as a byproduct. You get uh, charcoal, biochar. And you can bury that. You can use it as fertilizer even. You, you add the... It's very effective fertilizer. It's really, really yeah. good. Yeah. So, so you're, and it's very clear, like you're putting, physically putting coal in the ground, back in the ground. Like it's very easy to understand. And you get fuel out of it. But of course, this entire process has to be, you have to think about it globally. Like you have to plan forest production, for example, forestry. It's one example that me and Dave want to use because forestry happens on a hundred year horizon. So you you have to do this kind of receding horizon planning that we're talking about. Uh, you at least need to have like sanity checks on what you're doing. So you ensure that there's sufficient fuel for the stuff that needs it. You're putting carbon in the ground. Maybe you can figure out that, well, if we do more public transit, you know, the, the demand for fuel decreases. There's more space to maneuver in the big old planning polytope, the big blob. There's a lot you can do. And it may be the case that we need to invest in, I don't know, refineries, for example. Uh, there's nothing like this in the degrowth or very little like this in the degrowth sphere as far as we can tell yeah like i'm i'm absolutely extraordinarily far from being up to date on any of these things but it would strike me as if we were really serious about dealing with decarbonization that you would bootstrap on the existing carbon infrastructure to get a decarbonized infrastructure right that the solution yeah, is there's not a lot you can do 
the, the solution is not to blow up the pipe now, but to use that pipe now to decarbonize in five years time or whatever. That's the general. That's I, I assume that's the most logical approach. Well, you take whatever you have on hand, and then that's why we need planning, because you kind of have to figure out how to fit all of this together. And no human can do this, really. You need sanity checks at the very least. Like, you need constraints. Uh, yo, absolutely. Like, I would see, like, you know, to the extent that you would want to plan a decarbonization thing, it would require probably models of the scale of the IPCC type reports to actually try and do it. Yeah. yeah. But they would exist for us within a framework then that is self-organized and as guides towards production. You know, our sanity checks, as you call it. So like these, these type of planning will work. We've done the kind of general high level look at how these interactions work. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Okay, yeah, as a society, we think that's a pretty good way we should go and right, let's try and implement this and use that to help and inform our progress etc etc and feedback into it yeah for me anyway it's easier to think in terms of constraints and you're, you're kind of you're pushing them a little bit and then the system moves a little bit and you push them a little bit more and that's that's fine actually we could go back a little bit to how the soviet system worked because in there you have which i recently learned you had something called the optimizing school which were like people talking about this uh, kind of you know you want to you want to optimize production they were looking at ways to... Uh, you have this thing called uh, cost rachet, right? It's this way of costing thing. Basically, uh, they're, they're trying to... They were trying to put a price on, on certain things. This is basically... The entire liberalization of the Soviet economy starts with these optimizing planners, sort of, uh, amusingly enough. So one of these guys... And I, I forget the name... Uh, one of these quirks of history. I forget what the name of the paper is, but uh, I found a. I think Dave sent me a, a really good paper on the history of this, like what led up to the the liberalization, and it turns out it's it's kind of comes out of the planning debate. And there there's also I don't know if you've heard of the uh, the Kosov interviews. So Alexei Safronov of uh, he's of the uh, Prime Numbers channel on YouTube. It's like uh, you know, Russian guys making videos on on communist topics. He did an interview with a guy who was one of the heads of Gosplan called uh, Vladimir Kosov, and this guy is still alive. He's in like his nineties, and it's really, really interesting. I don't know if he's published them anywhere. He sent me a link over email. I could share it with you, uh, but it gives an insight into how. Gosplan actually worked and it's really really interesting like the kind of problems they had getting accurate data and and uh, you know they, they talk about stuff like they get they get a lot of bad input from people typing in you know over terminal so they had, they had to put in what they call gates uh, to like sanity check the reports coming in they weren't at least the higher ups at Gosplan were like ide- ideologically committed like they wanted things to work but that there was also like really concrete problems like they couldn't get data fast enough it was inaccurate so there's a lot of stuff like that well thomas thanks for coming on the show today do you want to plug your website or anything else that you've been working on recently yeah i mean the listeners can check out my website and i have you know i write, write about planning and i have a youtube channel as well i haven't I may be putting up more videos there. We'll see. I will also take the opportunity to plug the INDEP network, International Network for Democratic Economic Planning. So yeah, check out the the indep.network website. Okay. Well, thanks very much for coming on the show today, Thomas. Happy to see we, we agree on a lot of things and I think we can continue to have uh, discussions and we'll probably reach some kind of consensus eventually.